This is Colin Selleck of Binghamton University. This video lecture is on the principles of work and energy. It's from chapter 14.1 through 14.3 of the book Dynamics by R.C. Hibbler. Today's objectives, you will be able to calculate the work of a force and apply the principle of work and energy to a particle or system of particles. Activities include applications, the work of a force, the principle of work and energy, and some problem solving. First, some applications. Here's a roller coaster. It makes use of gravitational forces to assist the cars in reaching high speeds in the valley of the track. How can we design the track, for instance the height or the radius of curvature, to control the forces experienced by the passengers? Crash barrels are often used along roadways in front of barriers for crash protection. The barrels absorb the car's kinetic energy by deforming. If we know the velocity of an oncoming car and the amount of energy that can be absorbed by each barrel, how can we design a crash cushion? So let's talk about the principle of work and energy. You remember Newton's law, F equals ma, and you remember from chapter 12, kinematics of a particle, the equation ADS is equal to VdV. Well, if we solve this equation for A, it's equal to V dV over dS, and substitute this A into Newton's equation, we come up with this. And simplifying, F dS is equal to M V dV. Now, if you integrate this, you yield an equation known as the principle of work and energy. This principle is useful for solving problems that involve force, velocity, and displacement. It can also be used to explore the concept of power. But first, to use this principle, we must first understand how to calculate the work of a force. So what is the work of a force? A force does work on a particle when the particle undergoes a displacement along the line of action of the force. So work is defined as a product of force and displacement components acting in the same direction. So if the angle between the force and the displacement vector is theta, the increment of work, du, is equal to f cosine theta times ds. Now u is work. So the component of the force along the direction of motion times the displacement is equal to work. Now by using the definition of a dot product, which you may remember A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. So if you use this definition and integrate, we can write the total work between points 1 and 2 is equal to the integral of F dr from R1 to R2. R1 and R2 are, are these two vectors here. Now, if F is some function of displacement, this is very common. This equation becomes the work between points 1 and 2 is equal to the integral from S1 to S2 of F cosine theta ds. If F is a constant and theta is a constant. We can write this equation as the work between points 1 and 2 is equal to the constant force. I'm putting a C meaning it's constant times cosine of theta times S2 minus S1. Work is positive if the force and the movement are in the same direction. If they are opposing, then the work is negative. If the force and the displacement are at right angles to each other, the work is zero. Let's take a special case, the work of a weight. The work done by the gravitational force acting on a particle, or the weight of an object, can be calculated using the work between points 1 and 2 is equal to the integral of minus w dy from points y1 to y2. Take a look at this here. So y is positive in this direction and the weight is pointing down. That's where the minus sign comes in here. 
this equation simplifies to work between points 1 and 2 is equal to minus the weight delta y. Again, the work of a weight is the product of the magnitude of the particle's weight and its vertical displacement. If delta y is upward, the work is negative since the weight force always acts downwards. Let's take another special case, the work of a spring force. When stretched, a linear elastic spring develops a force of magnitude F sub S is equal to K times S. Now K is the spring constant, and S is the displacement from the unstretched position. That's very important. Unstretched position. So the work of a spring force moving from position S1 to S2 is U between points 1 and 2 is the integral of the force of the spring integrated from S1 to S2. Now since S of S is K times S, this becomes S1, S2, K, S, dS. And of course, this integrates to 1 half ks2 squared minus one-half ks1 squared. Now if a particle is attached to the spring, the force F sub S exerted on the particle is opposite to that exerted on the spring. Thus the work done by the particle by the spring force will be negative. The work between points one and two is negative one-half k times S2 squared minus S1 squared important equation. Here's some important notes about spring forces. These equations are for linear springs only, so that means the force is k times s. Spring constant is constant. Uh, the work of a spring is not just the spring force times the distance at some point, like this equation here. This is a trap that students often fall into. And always double check the sign of the spring work after calculating it. It is positive work if the force on the object by the spring and the movement are in the same direction. The way I like to think about it is, I imagine myself, if I have stretched the spring initially to one meter, and I stretch it to two meters, I have to put work into that to do that, right? I have to stretch the spring more, so therefore the work is negative. Okay, so now we know about the work done by a weight, the work done by a force, and the work done by a spring. So now let's derive the principle of work and energy. So you remember Newton's equation at F equal ma, and we had this kinetic equation from chapter 12, ADS equal VDV. We can substitute A in here and get F dS is equal to mv dV. Now we can integrate both sides. So F delta S is equal to 1 half m v2 squared minus v1 squared. I can rewrite this as the summation of all the work done by all the forces between points 1 and 2 is equal to t2 minus t1. Now t2 is defined as kinetic energy and it is 1 half mv squared. So I can rewrite this equation as the kinetic energy at point 1 plus the summation of all the work done by all the forces between points 1 and 2 is equal to the kinetic energy at point 2. Now remember work can be either positive or negative, it's a scalar. But the kinetic energy, it's also a scalar, but it's always positive since the velocity is squared and mass is always positive. So to summarize, the particle's initial kinetic energy plus the work done by all the forces acting on the particle as it moves from initial position to final position is equal to the particle's final kinetic energy. Let's talk about units. Both kinetic energy and work have the same units. The units are energy. Those units are newton meters or joule. So one joule equal one newton meter. In the FPS system, it is a foot-pound. Or it's also written sometimes like this. 
Now, the principle of work and energy cannot be used in general to determine the forces directed normal to a path, since those forces do no work. The principle of work and energy can also be applied to a system of particles by summing the kinetic energies of all particles in the system and the work due to all forces acting on that system. Let's take a look at another special case. This is work of friction caused by sliding. So when a body slides over a rough surface, there is a frictional force developed. So let's consider this block here. It's acted on by a constant force P over some distance S, and it has the same velocity at both locations. So the applied force P would just balance the frictional force, which is mu sub k times n. Mu sub k is the kinetic coefficient of friction, and n is the normal force. So the free body diagram would look like this. Normal force and weight. So let's apply the principle of work and energy. You remember kinetic energy at point 1 plus the work done between points 1 and 2 is equal to kinetic energy at 2 is 1 half the mass times the velocity squared plus the work done by the force P minus the work done by the frictional force. That's equal to the kinetic energy at point 2, which is 1 half mv squared. These cancel. So this is satisfied if P is equal to mu sub k n. So that just means if the block is moving with a constant velocity with some force P, then P is equal to the frictional force. So let's take an example. So when S is 0.6 meters, the spring is not stretched or compressed. That's very important. That tells you the unstretched length of the spring. There's a 10 kilogram block, which is subjected to a force of 100 newtons. It has a speed of 5 meters per second down the plane of 30 degrees. Find the distance S when the block stops. So we have forces, we have velocity, and we have displacement. It's an ideal candidate to use the principle of work and energy to determine S. So we're going to apply the principle of work and energy between positions 1 and 2. So at position 1, we're given that S sub 1 is equal to 0 0.6 meters. And at 2, that's what we're looking for. So let's write down an equation, the kinetic energy at point 1 plus the work done between points 1 and 2 is equal to the kinetic energy at point 2. Now there is work done by three different forces, right? We have the applied force of 100 newtons, we have the spring force here, plus we have the weight, m times g. So let's do each of those. So first, the work of the force 100 newtons. Now it is along the displacement vector so its work is just its magnitude times S2 minus 0 0.6. Now there's the weight, the work done by the weight. So work done by the weight. Now it is the component of the weight vector along the plane times the displacement. So that would be the mass is 10, so it's 10 g times the sine of 30 times S2 minus 0 0.6. Lastly, we have the work done by the spring. Now the spring constant is 200 newtons per meter, so the work done by the spring is minus 1 half times k times the change in displacement squared. So these three equations are the work done. So remember our equation again, kinetic energy at 1 plus the total work done between 1 and 2 is equal to kinetic energy at 2. So the kinetic energy at point 1 is 1 half the mass times the velocity which was given as 5 meters per second squared 
plus. Now I'm going to add in those three work equations that I derived in the previous slide. All of that is equal to zero because the kinetic energy at point two is zero. We were asked how far down will the block go, and that means the velocity at point two is zero. So this is the quadratic equation you can solve for S. It comes out to be 2.69 meters. So here's another problem. We have a two pound break at A. It slides down a smooth roof. Now whenever you see it's smooth, that means we can ignore friction. And its initial velocity is five feet per second. We want to find the speed at B and the distance from the wall to the ground D and also the speed at point C. And the roof is on a three on four slope and we have these two dimensions here. So we're going to use work and energy to determine the speeds and then we'll use the kinematic equations from chapter 12 to determine the distance D. So let's apply the principles of work and energy to the brick and determine the speeds at points B and C. So between points A and B we have the kinetic energy at A plus the work done between points A and B is equal to the kinetic energy at point B. So the kinetic energy at A, well, has a velocity of 5 feet per second and a mass of uh, 2 over 32.2, so it's 1 half 2 over 32.2 times the velocity squared, which is 5 squared. Now the work done between A and B, well, we have a 2 pound weight dropping 15 feet, so the weight and the displacement are in the same direction, so the work is positive, so that's 2 times 15. And that's equal to the kinetic energy at point B, which is 1 half the mass times the velocity at B squared. And solving for velocity at B, we get 31.48 feet per second. So let's find the velocity at point C. So the kinetic energy at point A plus the work done between points A and C is equal to the kinetic energy at point C. So again, the kinetic energy at point A is the same. It's 1 half 2 over 32.2 times 5 squared. Now the work done between points A and C is that two pound weight dropping a total of 45 feet. And again, that's positive work. So it's two times 45. That's equal to one half uh, the mass times the velocity at C squared. And solving for the velocity at C, we get 54.1 feet per second. Great, so now we know the velocity at C. We still need to calculate the distance D. Well, we know the velocity at point B now. We know the direction of the velocity at point B. So we should be able to use our projectile equations to solve for D. So let's do that. So this is the projectile. So we will do it in two separate parts. We'll do it in the x direction and the y direction. Remember, in the x direction, the velocity is constant. So that means that the position at point C is equal to position at point B plus the component of the velocity in the x direction of point B times the time it takes to get from point B to C. Now x at C is just equal to D. x at B, well B is at zero, and the velocity of B in the x direction is, on the previous slide, we got 31.48. Uh, the component of the x direction is times four-fifths. You see that here. Times the time it takes to get from B to C. So now I have an equation for D in terms of the time it takes to get from B to C. So let's do the, this is the uh, x direction. Let's do the y direction. So remember um, the equation for the velocity in the y direction for projectile is the y is equal to the initial y plus the initial velocity in the y direction times the time from b to c minus one half g t b to c squared. Remember the acceleration is uh, constant minus g.
So y at c is 30, y at b is 0, plus the component of the velocity at b in the y direction, which is negative, so it's minus 31.48 times 3 fifths times the time it takes to get from b to c minus one half 32.2 time it takes to get from b to c squared. <clears throat> Quadratic equation you can solve for the time it takes to get from b to c that's 0.899 seconds and substitute that in this equation here and we get d is 6.8 996 times 0.899, 22.6 feet. This concludes chapters 14.1 through 14.3, Principles of Work and Energy. Up next, 14.4, Power and Efficiency.